So, uh, first of all, what news do we have? There is a few things I, I, I was supposed to tell you. Oh, the tutorial one is out, so the handout is out. You can pick it up. Uh, we're going to have tutorials next week on Friday, right? Tutorials are between 9 and uh, 5, I think 5. Um, also, quite a few of you asked about the tutorials. Uh, I'm not involved in the tutorial allocation, so all I can tell you is that uh, there, there is a person whom I can get in touch with. Uh, normally, I am told not to get involved, uh, not to meddle in his, um, uh, in his affairs. Um, but if uh, the tutorial allocation doesn't work for you, I can manually register you for a tutorial class in week four. Even if you're not happy, right, I can shift you around. There's no problem there. Um, all right, so I'm not the right person to ask. The right person to ask, or the right people to ask, are the ones in the undergraduate uh, office. There is a course system in which you can appeal, right? So handle everything uh, through the system. If you're still not happy, uh, in week four, I'm just going to uh, uh, put you wherever you want to be. I'm uh, not very strict about class sizes, so uh, we'll find a way to work it, work it out. Uh, all right, um, what else? Uh, quite a few of you submitted comments to the uh, lecture notes, right, through the website. So thank you for that, and it's great. But uh, a few of you try to continue the conversation by email. After I, so whenever I reply to your comment, I also send a notification by email. And, and uh, what I got it was a continuation of the discussion via email, and that's co totally counter counterproductive. So you, when you receive the notification, please go to the site and submit your further comment there so that the comments are registered and, and uh, uh, everybody can see them, right? That's the important thing, that everybody can benefit from the uh, discussion. Um, all right. Uh, also, quite a few submitted comments about the lecture that was about to come, about today's lecture, right? So, and I did entertain the comments, but in general, I won't. So, comments for a specific set of lecture notes should happen after the lecture. So, I'm trying to put the materials there in advance, right? And it's fine if you want to take a, a peek. But let's have the lecture first, and then we can have the comments. Because there is information that is given through the lecture. I'm in, I intend to give it in the lecture that will clarify certain things in the notes. So at that point, when you read the notes, you'll be better prepared. Um, OK, so that's about it. Uh, today's lecture is about C and assembly languages. We are trying to uh, get a short reminder of C, get a short reminder of what a assembly language should look like. As I promised last time, I'm not actually going to teach a specific assembly language, but rather something that resembles it, but still uses your knowledge of high-level languages so that uh, you would be on familiar territory. What we want to understand. So first of all, uh, C is the mother of languages in a certain, or the father of languages, whatever gender you want to assign to uh, C. Uh, right is the language in which all the other languages are uh, implemented. Um, all right, so uh, all the other languages are useful in their own way, but we need to understand the relationship of those languages to C. So C is a language that you have to know well. You can't leave the uh, your undergrad studies without good knowledge of um, C. And then C was devised as a portable assembly language, as we're going to see later. So we want to understand the relationship between assembly languages and C. And uh, one of the more important things, there are two that I want to, to emphasize today. One is translation schemes, so various constructs of C, how, the, how would they be translated into assembly language? Uh, and uh, the other thing is, what kind of skill do you need in order to be able to um, to uh, program in, a, in an assembly language. Uh, so before that, there was a little, uh, a little set of slides that I was planning to do last time, and I didn't have time. So let me do it now. If I can find the folder.
right? So with uh, better tools, we can do more stuff, right? So I'm going to give you an example of two kinds of tools that sort of try to achieve the same thing, but they have different powers. And they're familiar with you. You go to the shopping center, you pick up a trolley, and you move it around. And you may have noticed that some trolleys, for some trolleys, all the four uh, wheels are swiveling, right? All the four wheels are swiveling, like the first one here, right? So we're going to say that this is sort of the power of a high-level language. For some other trolleys, uh, not all the four wheels are swiveling, only the two front wheels are swiveling, right? So you can still steer, but you have uh, limited, um, limited uh, uh, maneuverability, all right? So let's see how this would work. For example, if you have a uh, four-wheel swiveling, uh, um, uh, swiveling um, uh, trolley, right? The center of rotation that gives you the smallest radius is exactly when, where the arrow points, right? So you can swivel it like this, and the center of rotation is, the radius is relatively small. With the other one, it's not as flexible, right? So the rotation here is, if you want the shortest radius of rotation, the, rota the center will be exactly in the middle of the two fixed wheels, right? That's where you can put, you can create other centers of rotation and put them anywhere you want, but in general, here, you can't rotate anywhere, you can't put the, the center of rotation here, for instance. The center of rotation always has to be on a line that goes through the two fixed wheels, right? Is this clear? It's like driving a car, right? So this is the best you can do. So now let's take the problem of parallel parking, right? Which is not that difficult if you have a trolley that has four swiveling wheels, all right? But if you have a trolley with only two swiveling wheels, right? So the sort of assembly language type, well, you might try this but it will fail, right? So what you want to do is something like this. And this is just a little trick, all right? Let's do it again. So, so this is what you want to do. This is just a little trick, but, and it does the same job, right? And that's what's going to happen. Every high-level language construct uh, relies on a little trick at the assembly language level. There's a repertoire of tricks that you need to learn. And once you have done that, you're as good an assembly language programmer as you were a high-level language programmer, right? You're going to be able to transfer your high-level programming skill into assembly language. All you need to understand is a repertoire of tricks. Okay? So remember that. Keep that in mind. Uh, all right, so now back to our <coughs> lecture slides. So we're going to try to remember a bit of C. Uh, with data types, simple and compound statements, uh, we're going to talk about systematic plantation schemes and uh, recursion. Just touch a little bit because we want to be prepared when we talk about procedures. We won't be touching procedures today, and I'm, I won't be talking about procedures in C. Uh, I would do that when we treat procedures in general for all programming languages. And then we're going to restrict C in such a way that it becomes as difficult to program in that restriction of C as it would be in an assembly language, any kind of assembly language, right? So you get to practice the skill of reasoning at that level. And we're going to go through, uh, through a few examples. And uh, we're going to see that the same uh, systematic translation schemes apply. Why C? I was just explaining. It was designed to be a portable assembly language. In the 70s, operating systems were largely written in assembly languages, right? Entirely, top to bottom 
in assembly language. And Kernighan and Ricci, the ones that uh, invented this language, try to capture as much as the of the flexibility of programming uh, of assembly languages into this new language, right? But making it available in its in the same format on all platforms, right? So then, the it 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 uh, came to be that most of an operating system, maybe 90% of it, could be written in C. Just a few device drivers needed to still be written in assembly language, and suddenly Unix became a portable operating system, right? Unix was the first portable operating system, was written in C, uh, and those 90% of the sources that were in assembly language, then uh, C, could be transferred without modification on any other architecture and produce a replica of the same operating system on the new architecture. Uh, it had to have as many characteristics of the assembly language as possible, so low overheads, right? You, we will see that many other programming languages have much higher uh, overheads, right? And then many other things that at the time were written in assembly language, most uh, typically compilers, for instance, compilers were written in assembly language, they, compiler writers switched to C, so C became sort of the language of system uh, software. Uh, this is why we want to understand, right? It's as close to uh, the, uh, the uh, to any kind of architecture as a language, a portable language, can be. Um, all right. So, a C refresher. Uh, I already got questions about <laughs> this uh, code. This code is computing the power of two numbers, a to the power of b. Uh, all right, and it works in a very simple fashion. It's it's a fast algorithm. So normally we have not, uh, integers that are on 32 bits. Um, all right, so uh, this is this explains this 31 here and this 30. I'm I'm going to show uh, the relationship in a minute. But let's see how the algorithm works. Uh, let let us understand how the algorithm works. I didn't think that I would have to explain it, but that maybe it's a good idea. So I'm going to consider four bit numbers, and I'm going to take a number a. And I will try to raise it to the power of 11, right? 11 in binary is 1, 0, 1, 1, right? So I'm going to start with this partial result here, having the value 1. And then I'm going to look at the first bit. And you see here, if the first bit is 1, and um, we're looking, we're work, working with 30, with 32 bit numbers there, but just imagine that this would be two here, right? So we're going to compute s equals s times s times a. So the next value of s will be one times one times a. So s becomes a. The next bit is zero. For zero, we're going to square s. So the second value of s is going to be a square. Sorry. Uh, let's keep the um, a square, right? So this is what happens here. So it goes further, it goes further, and then the next guy is 1. So we're going to do s times s times a. So the next value is going to be a to the fifth. So s is going to be equal to a to the fifth. And finally, I'm going to look at the last bit here. And again, I'm going to do s times s times a. So the next value is going to be s equals a to the power 11. Okay? So this is how it works. It looks at all the bits, starting, to the, from, starting from the most significant one. It keeps going. Whenever we see a 1, we square s and multiply by a. When we see a 0, we only square s. That's why the soft, that, that's why this, this, uh, what, what, what this uh, program is doing, what this function is doing. How do I test the most significant bit? All, uh, the, how do I test the bits in order all the time? Well, it's very easy, right? The most significant bit is 1 shifted to the left 30 times. There are 32 bits, right? So there are 32 bits. So there's a, there's a bit, 30 more bits, and there's another bit. I put a 1 here. To move this 1 to this position, I have to shift 30 times. So 1 to the power of 30, 1 shifted, 
uh, by 30 will put the one in the most significant bit. So then I can, I can test this guy, right? How do I further test the, the next bits? Well, there's two ways. I can shift this bit less and less, or I can shift B to the left. Every time I shift B to the left, I'm going to discard the most significant bit, and the second most significant bit becomes the most significant one, right? So you see here that we are all the time performing this shift operation, okay? To avoid errors due to sign, right, uh, what we do here is we um, always Right, I, I, want, I want, before I shift, if the first bit was zero, I want to delete it, right? In order to delete it, this number is going to be what? So one, one, shifted 30, is going to be one, followed by 31 zeros. If I subtract one, it's going to be what? It's going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, 31 ones, right? If I mask, if I use this as a mask here, what am I going to do with B? I'm going to delete its most significant bit, right? That's because I want to avoid signed, signed based errors, right? I, I don't want to, um, to be bothered with the signed bit. I don't want to produce an overflow, okay? So that's the reason why we do this. All right, is this clear? Basically, this is how the algorithm is. Now, let me tell you, it doesn't really matter what this function does. We're using it as an example of a program, so that's not very important. You can look at it and uh, uh, understand what it does later. But let's uh, uh, re remember some terminology. So a program is a collection of functions, right? The blue blobs are functions. Main. One function has to be called main, right? And it's the entry point in the program. And that function must have a return type end. And optionally, needs to have these arguments, which would be a means of collecting the command line arguments from the command line. Um, all right. Next. Each function has a body. The body is whatever is between the outermost braces of the functions. And whatever is in between uh, braces, including the braces, is called a block. So we have multiple blocks, and we can have nested blocks. Right? You can see that we have blocks inside blocks, so those are nested blocks. We have local variable declarations at the top of any block, right? And unlike more evolved languages, such as C++, Java, C Sharp, uh, the variable declarations must appear at the top. Uh, and this is a sort of inconvenience, and uh, many compilers have um, uh, relaxed it. You can declare variables anywhere. C GCC does that. So you may have been used already that you can declare your variables anywhere. The standard C requires that they would be declared at the top of the block. Any block, right? I could go, so this may be something that you're not so used to, I could go and define a new variable right here inside the branch of an F, as long as it is right after a, an open brace. Okay, scope. So we have the declarations, which are highlighted in magenta, and the blue blob represents the scope of those variables. Those variables are visible in that block, right, <laughs> including the nested blocks, as long as those nested blocks do not define variables with the same name. So uh, a, a declaration has limited, um, a, a limited range, a limited scope. Uh, so what I did here was to move out, if you look carefully, right, we have this, uh, this declaration here. So I've moved it out just to create a global declaration and um, show, showcase one, right? 
So the scope of a, the global or a de declaration is the remaining of the program from that, from the place of that global declaration. And by the way, these are not two different files. It's one file, just that, that I'm trying to use the space uh, as uh, judiciously, ju judiciously as I can. So you can think of the text going from here in the left column and continuing in the right column. Um, what about declarations? It, they have three parts. There's a type, there's a list of variables, and each variable may have an initializer, right? And this is also what uh, is, is common in many languages. So uh, uh, C++, Java, C Sharp would have the same syntax. Schema, unfortunately, not, right? But it's easy to understand. And that value is the value that will be given to the variable when the variable is created. So this variable, because it has a limited life span, right? Whenever it will be created and la then later destroyed, when it is created, it will be initialized immediately with that value. Uh, expressions are language constructs that have values. So we have two essential constructs in a language, expressions and statements. The expressions have value. Statements do not have value. That's the main difference. Uh, and you can see examples of expressions. We can have Boolean expressions, what we call Boolean expressions. In fact, all the uh, expressions in C have the type or somehow will be converted to the type end eventually. Um, all right, we have constants here. We have arithmetic expressions here. Uh, and we have function calls. So function calls are expressions. They return values, and those values can be used. A string is an expression as well, and it's what kind of expression? Well, is it a variable? Is it an operator? What is it? The constant, right? Zero is a constant. A string that we see here is a constant, right? So the other component, type of component is a statement. And now, uh, statements, we have several types, quite a few types, but there are, there are several that are very basic, right? Assignment, uh, and, and these are simple statements. Right, assignment, return statements, and function calls. We'll see later break and continue, for instance. We'll also see the go-to statement, right? But for the time being, let us be limited to these. Each statement is uh, terminated by a delimiter, which is semicolon, right? So remember that the delimiter is a terminator of the statement. It's not a separator of statements. Uh, as it would be in Pascal, right? So in Pascal, for instance, at the end of a block, I don't need to put a semicolon after my statement because there's nothing to separate. Whereas in C, we do need to put a semicolon at the end of every statement because the semicolon is a terminator of the statement. Uh, all right, this, these are simple statements. Compound statements are statements that contain other statements or possibly blocks. And uh, we see here the while and the if um, statements. And inside these statements, we would have nested statements. So these statements can take, um, as part of uh, themselves, they can take blocks, not just simple statements, but blocks. OK, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not saying a lot of new stuff. Uh, that's why I go a bit quickly. Um, the uh, uh, right if statement, it has the following parts. There's an if condition, all right? Then, then there's a then branch, what we call a then branch. And the keyword then does not appear in C, but we're defining this terminology in a generic fashion. We will see other languages that have a then keyword introducing the then branch. So we, we will call this the then branch. And uh, you can see that. Uh, there's an else branch so uh, uh, that, that an if statement can have, but that is optional. So some if statements do not have an else uh, branch. 
Right, so if condition, then branch, else branch. Uh, remember that. While statements, we also call them loops, right? They have a while condition and a while body or a loop body. Um, where the loop body, again, can be a uh, block and it has nested statements. All right, for functions, functions have, uh, right, so, so uh, when, when you talk about functions, we have to talk about the function definition and the function calls, right? And in general, I prefer instead of function, the term procedure, and I will use most often procedure because it's generic and works for many languages. Uh, the uh, authors of C specifically named their procedures functions because they return, every procedure in C returns a value, so effectively it is a function. Um, but uh, not necessarily in, in the mathematical sense because you can call the same function twice when the, with the same argument and not get the same result, which is not the notion of function that we get from mathematics. In mathematics, a function, you put the same argument there twice, you get the same result every time. Um, all right, so whenever we distinguish between the definition and the call, and whenever we look at a definition, we have a formal argument or parameter list, and whenever we look at a call, we have an actual argument or parameter um, list. All right, so we're gonna be using this um, uh, terminology whenever I say Formal argument, I'm referring to the definition of the function. Whenever I say the actual argument, I'm referring to the call or a call of the function. Uh, the syntax of the formal arguments requires a type and a name. There's no possibility of uh, default value. So some languages will have a default value here. If the argument is not provided, then the argument is automatically inserted by the compiler with a default value. So we have a type and a name. And then whenever we call the function, we must match the number of arguments and the types of the arguments. Right? Whenever we want, we have two arguments of type end in the formal argument list, we have to call with two arguments of type end in the actual uh, argument uh, list. Some languages are very strict about this. So those are uh, languages with strict typing, C actually is not that strict. So it will typically only warn you. It's not an error to put in different arguments and possibly different types. There will be certain conversions that are uh, performed by default. We're gonna talk about those uh, later. But because of historic reasons, uh, C does not enforce uh, type strictness for, for functions. All right, so here we have a definition. Here we, uh, we explain exactly what definition is. The entire <coughs> listing of um, the power function it's, is its definition. The function call is here. And you see the function call appears before the function definition. And therefore, to inform the compiler about <coughs> the correct usage of the call, we have to provide a prototype that must appear before the uh, function use. The function definition may, may be used as its own prototype, but that would mean that we need to switch the places of the power function and the main function, right? If we switch the two roles, we don't need a prototype anymore. Uh, nevertheless, in general, Many prefer as a style to write the main function first and the other functions um, uh, later in the file, and then all the functions should have a prototype. Again, um, the, uh, the compiler doesn't enforce the, uh, the need for prototype. Uh, in many cases, you will only get a warning. It will assume a certain type, and then if the assumed type doesn't match the defined type, it will issue an error, but the assume, if the assume type does match the defined type, you will only get a warning. All right. So, is this more or less clear? Any questions so far? Okay, fine. 
So execution of C programs is based on the notion of state. And uh, so far, I've, I've heard that you're, you're coming from either C or Java or Scheme. All these languages have state, so you should be familiar with. What do we mean by state? Uh, so state in general is somehow the configuration of the environment around you, right? Uh, if um, I take this uh, pen tablet and I put it here, whatever action I take about the pen tablet later, it will have to take into account that the pen tablet is here, right? And it's no longer here. If I devise a robot arm to move the tablet further, it will only have to, it will only be able to proceed from the current state of the environment, meaning to pick the tablet from here, right? So it's similar with programs. For programs, the values of all the variables, the contents of memory, the entire contents of memory is the state of the program, right? Now, uh, how much state do you have depends on how much memory you use. Many programs only use variables without any dynamically allocated memory. So the values of all the variables in the system, the current values of all the variables are the state. And it is important in devising your program to understand that the program moves from one state to the next. You have an assignment x equals x plus 1, right? You're moving from the state, right, where you take the current value of x into a new state where the x has a value that has been incremented by 1, right? And whatever operation follows next, it will have to take into account the current state. Um, all right, so the entire contents of memory is accessible to the uh, program. If you use dynamically allocated memory, you have to take that into account as well. And uh, uh, each statement takes the state to a new state. That's uh, what I saw. And you can easily see this in a debugger. And we're going to see a uh, debug debugging session soon. Uh, I am partial to this IDE for C. Um, I, I use Visual C++ um, on occasion as well, but most of my work is <coughs> um, in Linux, so uh, I prefer that one. And whenever I switch to Windows, see if I do, I like to stay in familiar territory. Uh, all right, so let's take an example and uh, and understand what we mean by by data types, right? So. C, because it has to be close to the machine, it will implement a range of data types that are accessible by the processor directly, right? All these are accessible by the processor directly, right? Integers, floats, characters, short numbers, long numbers, and so on. So I'm going to take this program, and I'm going to execute it in debugger, and uh, we'll, we'll see what the values R and try to explain the values of the variables. Uh, all right, so what I did here was open a project. I'm uh, trying not to waste time. And this is the program. Uh, all right, so all we do is some assignments and some conversions of types from one, from one type to another. Right, and we want to see what are the sizes of, of some of the um, uh, variables uh, just to get acquainted with data types. So I'm just going to execute this program. And the screen is a bit small, and I don't need this. All right, you see that every line is declared separately. Um, so these are all the variables declared in the program. And you see, initially, they would have random values, which means that you know, if we don't assign them, C really doesn't make any assumptions about the values of the variables. Doesn't try to help in any way. Java does. Java initializes all the variables with zero or the equivalent of zero, right? If it's a reference, it will be null. So very good. So let's start executing. Right, so no surprise here. I'm, I'm not sure how visible it is. Oh, quite visible. So you can see the variable that was just changed, you, you can see it here. 
right? So th th there's no surprise there. And then we compute the size of A, no surprise there either, four bytes, right? Then long, long B, right? What is long, long? Louder. 64-bit integers, right? So the new Pentium is a 64-bit machine. We have 64-bit integers at the processor level, and that is also available at the level of C. And, of course, if we check the size of B, we get 8, 8 bytes. Now, it's interesting to see what happens if I take an integer and I assign the 64-bit integer to a 32-bit integer. Louder. The lower 32 bits, very good, right? So you see that B truncated is a different value. How would we know how this happened? Well, we can do the following thing. I'm going to add a watch. And I'm going to take the value of B and put it in hexadecimal, right? So you see the value of B right here in hexadecimal. And I'm going to do the same for B trunk. Ah. And then we'll see the relationship between B and B trunk. So B trunk, and we want again hexadecimal. So can you see the relationship? Can you see that B trunk has the last eight digits of B in hexadecimal? which means that the lower four bytes of B were moved into B trunk, not the higher order four bytes, right? This in general makes sense. When do you want to assign a long long to an int? When the long long value is small enough to fit into an int, right? You doesn't really make sense. If you have a value that doesn't fit into a, uh, an int, why would you want to assign it to an int, right? So this will perform the correct conversion. This sort of retains the current value. If the value was between 0 and to the power of 31, right, in the long long, then performing this kind of assignment would, would, would preserve that value. All right. Uh, further... So we have a B trunk one where we take B and take the reminder, take sorry, the, yeah, the reminder of dividing by um, one to the 31. So B trunk one has exactly the same value. And this goes to show that in arithmetic terms, this is the operation that happens. Right? When we assign a smaller, a variable of a smaller length, a variable of a bigger length to a variable of a smaller length, right? it's the reminder of dividing by 2 to the power of the number of bits of the lower length. Okay? So when we do this, there's an implicit conversion, or what we call a coercion. Happens implicitly in C. And this is one uh, big, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, subject of debate because uh, people say that this is dangerous behavior and should not be allowed. These conversions should require explicit cost. How would we perform a cost here in front of B? What should we, what do we need to write? Int brackets, right? So that will perform an explicit conversion. So it means that a program is, programmer is conscious of the fact that the conversion has to be performed. We don't want implicit things, right? So one, one, one line of, um, uh, of thought in, in programming is that 
we should not have uh, implicit behavior. Everything should be as explicit as possible. All right, so let's continue. We have the float data type, right? So C is B divided by A. There's a surprise here. So we divide B by A, and B is not divisible by A, so it should give us some decimal places, right? But you can see that it doesn't. Why? Right. Very good. So what happens here is the following. First, this operation is performed. First, this operation is performed. A value is obtained. That value is later assigned with some coercion to the left-hand side of the assignment. Right? So when we perform an integer, so let's, let's look, look at the highlighted operation, right? We have an integer b, an integral, an integral data type b, and another integral data type uh, a, right? So the division will result in an integer. Integer divided by integer will give us an integer, integer division, right? So the reminder will be thrown away. Once that value is obtained, it is converted into a float. All right? So this is a float value. It has the type of float. It has the encoding of a float. But it is the conversion of the result of b divided by a, integer division. That result was 10,000 integer. So the 10,000 integer was converted to a 10,000 float and assigned to c. What happens with d now? So D is also 10,000. What do you think that is? Uh huh. So what the following thing is going to happen. Float A is, is converted to a float. Right? Now the division is between a float and an integer. Right? A long long. So we try to convert the long long into a float. The precision of the float is how many digits? About seven digits, right? So only the first seven digits will be retained. So it will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven point zero to the power of whatever is remaining. I think it's about 10 more digits there, to the power of 10, right? So there will be a loss of precision when this B is converted into a float. And then we have the division of the two floats, but we have lost the decimal places, so the result is still 10,000, all right? So, um, actually, the next two are not so relevant, so let's skip them. So, let's look at the next one. Now, we are converting A to double. Double has a precision of how many decimal places? About 15 or 16, right? So, that number, this value of B, will fit with full precision into a double. So when we perform this operation, we're actually going to see the decimal places that we were after, right? So we're converting A into a double. We're converting B into a double. A double has enough room to hold all these significant digits of B. And therefore, in the division, we're going to capture the uh, decimal places. If I say char f equals a, what are we going to a get? Well, how are we going to get the value? Or let me let me do something else. Let me add a watch here and say a in hexadecimal. Right, so can you tell me the value of f? The lower a bits, right? Can you see it? I'm not sure whether it's big enough to see. 
So the current value is 49960D2. So the lower eight bits are going to be D2, right? So F is going to become D2, right? Which represents the value minus 46. How do we know it's D2? Well, we'll have to convert it. So I'm going to add another watch, say F and hexadecimal, and you can see F that it is D2. Okay? Now, if I do an unsigned char, G, being assigned F, what's going to be the value of G? Same hexadecimal, right? But the value of F here is minus 46. If I'm going to go another step, right, the debugger is going to show me the value of G in decimal. What's going to be the value of G in decimal? Two hundred and ten. Very good. Okay. Two hundred fifty-six minus forty-six. Two hundred and ten. So you can see the two hundred and ten there. You can see. That the character representation, which is right next, hasn't changed, which means that the bits have not changed. Only the interpretation of those bits has changed. Is this clear? This should be stuff that you should remember from computer architecture. Float h equals f. So h is going to be what value? You see, there's two ways of converting data. One is copying the bits but changing the interpretation, which is what happened here, right? We just copied the bits but changed the interpretation. Or trying to preserve the notion of value that we get from mathematics. So when I'm going to do float is assigned an, a char, I'm going to look at that char as the value minus 46, and I'm going to try to preserve the value minus 46. And I'm showing you this because this is, these are decisions that you, as a language designer, whenever you get into that, um, that um, uh, role, right, you might have to make. What kind of coercions and how do you convert from one type to another? Um, what happens here? So this is a tough one. Louder? Can you try to explain what happens in terms of in terms of how by how bits or bytes or whatever are copied from one place to another? So Right, what we're doing is H is a four byte character, four byte uh, data, right? When I put this cost in front of it, I'm going to see the address of H no longer as a float, a pointer to float, right? So when I put the ampersand in front of H, that's a pointer to float. I convert the pointer to float into a pointer to character. And then I assign a character to that. So G is a one byte piece of data. What kind of transfer happens? This is H and this is G. What kind of transfer happens? This byte goes here. The other three bytes stay the same, right? Unchanged. It's very difficult to predict the value now. So we can execute, we're going to see some random value. When is this kind of operation useful? Mm, not likely. Yeah, potential. Yeah, it's, it could be. But very typical when? When we re we convert network packets from one protocol to another, for instance, right? So we have to assemble 
the packet, the network packet, byte by byte. And for instance, some of the data may be floating point, but you have to assemble it byte by byte. Or you're converting a, um, a uh, string of digits into a floating point number, right? So you have to be, we have to really know what you're doing because the effect here is relatively difficult to predict. So I'm going to execute this. And you see, the effect of that byte being written there is just, it changed a few decimal places, right? It's not a very useful kind of computation, except for a very narrow uh, area. And then, what am I going to be doing here? The next one. Changing the most significant byte. I'm not sure how, not all the bits there are the exponent, right? Only about only about seven of them. One is the sign, yeah. So the exponent. So then we go and do this, and again the result is a bit unpredictable. We can't know in advance what's going to happen, right? So it's only useful when we are assembling data byte by byte for a network packet, for instance. Okay, so this was this was the a first example in um Ah, uh, I did a wrong, something wrong. So I'm going to have to restart uh, the the environment. Um, all right. So this was the program. These are the the primitive data. Okay. Another important kind of data that appears in C are pointers, and pointers are typically used in relation with tables. We want to create uh, tables or sometimes linked structures. So let's try to do this one by hand. We can do the demo in the debugger as well. But let's let's try to predict the values here. So we have an array, 3, 5. What size do we get here? 60, right? Very good. 3 times 5 times 4. The size of a line, 20, right? So five, one line has five elements times four for each. The element size, four, right? One integer. If I assign a, let's say I assign a11 to 10. Then I do this, right? I declare a pointer P that is the address of A. So the interesting thing is, this is the address of A, right? A is stored in memory as 60 bytes, this is the address of A, P will have the same address. Okay? So it's relatively straightforward. Obviously, I have to perform the cast to avoid a warning because the address of A is a pointer to an array of 3 by 5. Right? So I need the conversion. What if I do not put the ampersand in front of A. What am I going to get? <coughs> yes, why is that? No, it's because the compiler will put back the ampersand here, will perform an implicit coercion. It will say, I don't know what the address, what, what, uh, how I convert an array to a pointer, but I can convert the address of A to a pointer. All right? So the compiler will put back the ampersand, will perform a coercion. And let's say we don't do anything. We don't put, we don't even use the cost. What's going to be the value of R? It's the same thing. The compiler will put this back. And then there's going to be a warning here saying that you're converting you're, you're converting a pointer of one type of pointer to another without an explicit cast. Right? But still, the, the statement goes through. So that's another point of contention for C. This, this behavior is 
um, is uh, considered to be dangerous. So then, if I say star r equals 100, what have we achieved? What element of the array becomes 100? The first one, right? A00 becomes 100. What if I do this? What is S? So it's a pointer to an array of size 3, 5, right? So you thought that this was a natural thing to do, right? The reverse of this, the counterpart of this, because I can either convert a to a pointer of a type of uh, a, a pointer of type int and assign it to a pointer of type int, or I can declare a pointer to an array of size three five, and I don't need to perform any cast here. The type of ampersand a is pointer to array of size three and five, All right? Why do we need the brackets here? Uh huh. Sort of, but I still not the answer I want. Because the star and the brackets are what? Are operators. And operators have precedence. The precedence of star is lower binding than the precedence of the brackets. If I didn't put the brackets, if I would write int star s bracket bracket, what is s now? It's an array of pointers, right? So in other words, the associativity, the precedence is like this. First I apply the brackets, and then for S is an array of pointers, right? So array of pointers, where if I write it like this, star S brackets, S is a pointer to an array of an array, right? So it's a matter of precedence. All right, this line. Star P plus A line size, remember this is the guy here. A L M size, this is the guy here. Right, plus one. B points to, or B gets the value of? A11, very good, right? So this guy, you can think of it multiplied by one, plus one, right? So this one and this one will give me a one, one. Right, why is that? Uh, remember, P is a pointer to integers, right? So how is the array stored? It's stored line by line, so we're going to have a zero zero, so I'm just going to write zero zero here up to zero five, then one zero up to one five, then two zero up to two five, and so on, right? All these are integers, so I have 20 bytes here, but p being an integer, I can't, I can't add 20 to p, I have to add, I have to add five, right? So 
the size of a line, which is 20, divided by the size of an element, which is 4, is going to be, give me 5, which is the number of elements in a line. Right? So, this will put me here at 1, 0. 1, 1 is here. And this one will move me one element further so I get to access A11. How about the next one? Where is this 20 going to go? A22, right? Very good. And we can verify this, right? So if I were in the debugger, I would like now to see that this C being initialized with this value. So you see, I assign to P, but I retrieve the value through S. But P, Q, R, S, all of them are pointer to the same place. But P, Q, R, S are pointers of different times, right? And we retrieve this C, and we would like to see that this guy is 20, right? So this value of C is 20. Is this clear? Questions? Okay. Four loops. Remember them, right? So this is for the benefit of the schemers. Um, have uh, four parts, right? So there's uh, an initializing statement. Right? There's uh, a condition, and there's an iterating uh, statement. Um, all right? So uh, one interesting thing here, here is to see whether we can translate for into while, right? So in th and this introduces the idea of systematic translation scheme. And you can see that these two programs are, in fact, equivalent. One uses a for loop, and the other one uses a while loop. And how do we translate from one to the other? Well, it can be done systematically. Right, we take each of the parts of the program, and we have a skeleton for, we, we see a skeleton for the for loop, we devise a skeleton for the while program, or the program that has the while uh, loop, and we just transfer these contents here, right? The first statement goes above the while loop, the for condition goes into the while condition, right? The iterating statement goes inside the while body. All right, and the rest of the program remains the same. So we can perform this translation systematically. So we can say that the for loop is just syntactic sugar for the while loop. Actually, it's not completely true, because when we introduce the continue statement, we'll see that while loops and for loops behave slightly differently. All right, but the essential thing is that while loops can always be translated. The do while loops are an alternative for performing loops, right? And the difference is that a while loop may never execute at all, right? The condition of the while loop may be false from the very beginning. The do while loop executes at least once, right? Much of the things that can be done in a uh, while loop can also be done in a do while, um, and often it's just an, uh, a matter of preference. But can they be can they be converted? Yes. Right? So we can convert from one to the other. How do we do that? Well, we take the body of the while loop and we put it twice because in the do while, right, this, the body executes at least once. How can I ensure that the body of the do while executes at least once? I put it above the while loop and this way it will execute at least once. Okay? And then the condition is copied as it is. So again, we have a systematic translation scheme. We have a skeleton for the while loop. We have a skeleton for the do while loop. We can convert from one to the other. OK? So these are looping statements or loops. Uh, the break statement. The break statement takes us out of the loop. All right? So it works for all kinds of loops, for while loops, for for loops, right? It takes us right outside of the loop. And uh, how do we translate? 
right? So the idea for translation is to set a flag and whenever and add the flag to the for loop to the to the condition, right? So so what one do is instead of using a break loop uh, a break statement, we have a flag here which is set to one, and here we also test whether the flag has been set, and at that point we stop executing the loop, right? That will be the idea, right? And well, actually, what I'm doing here is I'm resetting the flag. So you see, instead of performing the break, I'm changing the value of the flag, and I'm also testing the flag here so I can get out. But actually, this is not quite equivalent, all right? And the reason for that is, the reason for that is that, you see, if I use this, if I use this, if I use this translation, this statement would still execute. Whereas in the variant where I have the break statement, it wouldn't execute, right? We would have one extra execution of the increment statement of the for loop. So we want to avoid that. So then what, what do we do? Instead of having the increment here, we should also take the increment and put it inside the body of the for loop so that we can avoid the execution, okay? So this is now equivalent, right? So if it's time to break, if it's time to break, set the flag. Otherwise, perform the increment so that whenever we're about to execute the break, whenever we're setting the flag, we also avoid the last execution of the increment statement. And again, this is a systematic translation. Continue statements. So if we perform, if we uh, execute a continue statement, we go right to the bottom of the loop. Not outside, but right to the bottom. So then the while condition can be executed again, can be tested again, and the program may continue to, the loop may continue to execute from there. And this is possible in a for loop as well, but the continuous statement in going to the bottom of the loop, the bottom of the loop is in fact before the execution of the increment operator. All right, so this is where there's a fundamental difference between while and for loops. The bottom of the loop in while Right, it's just before retesting the while condition. The bottom of the loop in four is just before the increment operator. So it's going to be the increment operator and then the uh, condition, right, retested, and then the program may continue, the loop may continue or not. Okay? So uh, how do we translate? If we have a while loop and we want to avoid a continuous statement, it's very easy. Right, we can put the remaining part of the uh, we can put the remaining part of the loop inside the uh, inside an if statement. Right, so this entire part goes in here. Okay, so we can avoid execution whenever the flag is set, which signals the fact that the continuous statement might have been might need to be executed. Why do we have the continue? Why is it convenient? Because you see the translation is so simple. Because sometimes the, the length of the while body is very large. The while body is very long. And this number of statements that you have to include in an if statement here, you put it inside an if statement, that number will be very large and makes the program less readable. Having the continuous statement in, improves readability. Um, there's a similar thing here. Right, but it works well, and it works well, right? So for the continuous statement, right, if you perform this translation based on an if statement, that works well uh, for the for loop as well. All right, so we only have a problem with the break. Okay, is this clear? So again, all these are systematic translations. <coughs> 
Go to statements. How many of you have used go to statements before? One, two, three, four. How many of you have been told? Five. How many of you have been told you shouldn't use go to statements? Not so many, you, I would expect, but definitely more, right? So the word of wisdom when you are uh, in, a, in an introductory programming course is don't use go to statement, right? It makes for unreadable programs. But remember, everything is a tool that should be used in the right place. The go to statement in C is there for a good reason, right? And actually, we're going to be making use of it quite a lot, not because I'm advocating the use of the go to statement, but it's because it's a skill that you should master, right? And you should decide when to use it and when not to use it. In application programs, it's probably unlikely that there's a need for such a statement and you should avoid it, right? However, you may be writing all sorts of, uh, you know, embedded system software where the go to statement will solve a variety of uh, problems for you because you want to interact with your code in a specific way. So, um, we're going to translate the while loop that we had into a loop that uses that, that I mean, we're going to eliminate the while loop. We're going to use a go to statement instead, right? So, remember what we had before. This is the code that we had before. Right? And this is the code that doesn't have a while loop anymore. What does the go to statement do? Simply goes to the label. So we get to execute the, this statement. Well, execution will just go here right away. Okay? And they resemble the branching instructions that you learned in assembly language. Whatever assembly language you have learned, right? That's uh, how they work. You just go wherever the target is. And uh, learning how to use go to statements will teach you about the skill of using branching instructions in, the, uh, in, in assembly language. So let's see how the translation proceeds. So what you see is we replace the while by an if. And the condition is copied inside the if condition, but there's a negation at the outer side, right? right? So there's an extra negation here. The body of the loop is copied from one side to the other. There's no, there's no change. All right. And what is highlighted in gold, this darker yellow is, uh, appears as gold in my, in my slide uh, development software, is this skeleton. Right? We can have a skeleton. But we can see a skeleton for the while loop and convert it into a skeleton for the program that doesn't have, that, that has a go-to statement, right? So these become placeholders. So there's a placeholder here, and there's a placeholder here, right? The green blob. And I fill the placeholder with the green blob on the left side, and I fill the yellow uh, uh, holder with the yellow blob on the left side as well, right? So it's a systematic translation. I can perform it every time, and I can convert all my programs that contain while loops into programs that don't have while loops anymore. OK? Is this clear? Systematic translation. So remember, when we invent, when we devise systematic translation schemes, we need to translate a program skeleton into an equivalent one. It must work for all the possible programs. It can be implemented by a compiler or a translator, though we don't want to go to the, the, the detail. That's why we call it a scheme, and we don't call it a compiler, right? We don't want to go to the full detail of translation, right? We want to exhibit a principle. It's not a compiler module. So what you have to do is, whenever we get a question in the exam is convey, right, the fact that you understand how this can be performed systematically, right, without necessarily looking at all the possible details. And through exercises in the tutorial, we're going to develop uh, this kind of uh, feeling, right? What really is a good translation scheme and what isn't? All right. So we have many more of these, right? We can simulate break continue with go to, right? And break is 
really easy. Go to break and we put a label outside the uh, outside of the loop and we have implemented the break statement. This label, if we perform multiple translations of multiple loops or multiple break statements inside the same program, each of these labels will have to have a new name, right? That's understood. You will have to invent a new label for each statement that you use. The same for continue. We can replace continue with a go to con. And notice one thing here. A label must point to a statement even though the statement might be empty. All right? You can't put a label before a closing brace. You have to put an open close brace. All right? That's a syntactic peculiarity of uh, C. The switch statement has a very interesting translation scheme. Um, all right, so uh, where are switch statements very prevalent? They're prevalent in um, simulation of, uh, of uh, automata, right? And what you see here is an automaton, right, that reads from its input, which can be an array, it reads characters. And we're going to see in the le next lecture that this is useful for implementation of lexical uh, analyzers, right? So we're initially in state zero. If on the input we have uh, a character A, then <coughs> the machine moves into state one and eats up the character. If the next character is B, it will move on into state B and eats up the next character as well, and so on and so forth, right? So the program is easy to write by switching on the state and we have our input in an array and there's a current character in the input which is indexed by i, right? So we switch on the state. If the state is zero, as you can see here, we're expecting a, right? And the next state should be one and that's what all we do. And if we somehow found, found, find ourselves either in the wrong state or in a state where the current character is not one of the legal inputs, we decide that that's an error, right? So this is, an, an error should be uh, signaled by the return value zero, and correct accepted input should be uh, the value of one. One of the states here is the final state, and we say that we accept the string when we are at the final state and we have consumed the input string completely, right? So whenever this length has been attained, if at that point we are back in the final state, the, fi the state with double circle, we say that we have accepted, we should return a one, otherwise we should return zero. So this is a simple program that simulates that, right? This is the state, this is the current state, this is the next state, right? And going from current state to next state is subject to a certain condition. And it's the same thing for all the cases, right? If my, if my current state is one, See, in one, legal input is B. So if my current input is B, I can go to state two. Otherwise, I can return an error. Uh, it's more interesting when we have multiple legal inputs. So at case at state two, if my legal input is A, the next state is one. If my input is B, the next state is three. Otherwise, it's zero. So we have a switch inside a switch. So now, this is the simulation. We're going to look more at this kind of automata in the next lecture, right? So I'm using it because it's a nice application of the switch st statement and also because it's an introduction that some, uh, to something that we're going to learn later. But let's see how we simulate this with uh, go-tos, right? So this is the switch statement. We, have, uh, we need to go through the, syn the syntax, syntax, right? So there's a switch keyword. There's a variable here that must be of integral type. Character, int, uh, long, 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 right? It cannot be a float. It has to be integral. And then we have case labels, right? And each of these are possible values for the variable that was given here or expression that was given here, all right? There's also a default label for the case when the value doesn't match any of the existing labels. And uh, typically we want, if we don't use a break statement, 
the execution will just continue with the next case, which is something that typically we don't want. So we have to put a break at the end of every case. Uh, everything is inside a loop here. Uh, the input is advanced at the end of the loop, and uh, this is how the program works. So let's see how we can simulate this. This is a nested one. This is another nested one. How do we simulate this? We simulate this with a computed go-to statement, which is a feature specific to G plus to GCC. All right. So look at this thing, which is probably looking very strange. Okay. Now, every case that we have seen in the previous slide, we don't have a switch statement anymore, but we have four labels which represent the four cases. We see that these four labels appear here with a double ampersand in front of them. What does the double ampersand mean? It means the address of the label. All right? So I can go to a variable that contains the address of a label, right? We have this array that is initialized with these four addresses of labels. And then, right, instead of having a switch, I'm going to have a go-to statement that goes to, so this star is part of the go-to syntax. It's not, you may think it's a, it's a pointer. No, go-to star is the computed go-to, go-to star. So you have to say go-to star and variable that contains or expression that that, um, that evaluates to the address of a label. So this case PTR of state will be the corresponding case for that state, right? So this is corresponding to state 0, state 1, state 2, state 3. And we can perform a computed go to. How long does it take to jump to the, cor to the correct case? Linear time, logarithmic, Oh, one. Very good. Constant time, right? So when you look at this, the switch statement, would you think that jumping from here, jumping from here to the correct case, which might be here, takes constant time? Not obvious, right? You may think, oh, well, maybe it, it, it performs an if statement. Maybe what internally the compiler does, it performs an if statement and checks whether it's zero then sequentially goes for and checks whether it's 1, and then sequentially goes and checks whether it's 2, and finally finds 3, right? Which would be linear time. But in fact, in fact, what happens is that internally the compiler takes the switch statement and converts it into a computed go-to statement, and jumping inside the case of a switch statement takes constant time. This is a major, major optimization. All right? Yes? No, it applies, it applies to any number. I'm just, I, 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 if you have 100 cases, you imagine that the program would, would be very long. Why, why, why wouldn't it? Again? Right, so case one will be a default, right? So what I put here for case one, I will put uh, L5, right? L5 is default. So, so let's say I don't have, let's say I don't have case two, right? Or ca case two, case two is this one, right? I just put L5 here. Default. Right? Again? Right. I'm going to have a, bit, a very big table here. Everywhere where I don't have a case, I'm going to fill in with the label of default. And it's going to be a very big table. Memory is cheap these days. 
damn cheap, right? Again? Why? What's the problem? If you have 1,000 cases, right, which are completely random numbers, right? If you want, you can have hashing. So you can organize the, you can, t you can turn this into a hash table if you want, right? If it's really, really large and it's really, really sparse, right? So you can have a, ha a hash table. But if you have 1,000 cases and those 1,000 cases are between 0 and 10,000 numbers, right? Then you have an array of 10,000 numbers. It's cheap, right? It's Again? The real thing that exactly that I can I can we can do it we can do it right now if you want I, we can do GCC minus s and I can show you the code that comes out of the compiler exactly that compilers actually compilers you know what you do if I write a for loop i equals one i less than hundred i plus plus something you know what let's say some instruction here. You know what a compiler will do to make the code faster? We'll, we'll put 100 copies or whatever you have in here. Why? Memory is cheap. <coughs> okay? All right. Uh, so, uh, let's, uh, we're going to do the val uh, next time. We're going to stop at the, uh, at the systematic uh, uh, translation. Um, Right, remember it's, a, it's an extension, okay? So the last thing that we discuss is recursion, just as a refresher. Schemers are probably experts in re uh, recursion. How many of you from coming from Java and Scheme feel comfortable with recursion? Ah, quite a few. So that's, that's a decent number. Uh, so what happens with recursion? You're calling the function while it is being defined, right? That's the problem. This is the same program that computes the power, and this is a much simpler algorithm because it is recursive. Often, recursive programs are much easier to understand if you understand how, how recursion works. So the problem in general is how can this be used while the function has not been fully defined? But you, can, you see that in the previous example, the function was used when the compiler knew only what? Only the prototype, right? So if I'm going back to the beginning, right here, okay, I'm using the function, and at this point, the compiler only has the information that was given here. And it was able to compile, right? No problem with compiling. It, it hasn't seen this yet, right? So going back to our recursion slide, at this point we are using the power, but the compiler has already seen the prototype. Actually, the prototype uh, starts from here. This is the prototype. So the compiler has the prototype, sees the use of a function for which the prototype is known, it can compile it. No problem, right? Same principle at, at work. If it worked for the first case, it should work for the current case as well, okay? Um, it's often a translation of a math math mathematical formula, right? So this is the original mathematical formula that led to this function. It computes the power. It says what? Well, a to the power of zero is one. and just for convenience for all the negative power values, because we want to stay in the realm of integers, we're going to say that the value of uh, a, a to the power of b is still 1. If b is odd, right, we're going to compute a times a to the power of b minus 1. So this is a recursive call. Okay? Because this is what we compute. So I'm going to compute a times recursive call a to the power of b minus 1. If b is even, I'm going to compute a to the power of b divided by 2 squared. And this, again, is a recursive call. And the translation from here into 
a recursive C function is immediate. There's almost a one-to-one -one translation, right? So oddity is checked by, well, you could check it in a mathematically, more mathematically friendly ways, but I'm going to challenge you with all these kind of expressions so that uh, you remember that these operations exist and they're more efficient in general. So we're going to stop here, right? Uh, notice how this is computed. There's a little demo on how it is going to be computed. And then next time, we're going to continue with assembly languages. And uh, we're going to take it at whatever, whatever step we can uh, go uh, so as to uh, keep a reasonable pace. So see you next time. Give me just a second. Uh -uh.